Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to try to use the full time today to walk you through the course and then motivate what you're going to have for the first assignment today, which is some reading and a little bit of uh, math homework to warm up for the course. Uh, yay, everybody loves homework on the first day, and I'm not shy about giving it. Thursday will be the first real assignment in physics uh, by itself, but I want you to use the next couple of days to kind of prep yourself for this course. All right, so I'm going to walk you through the basics today. You've got a lot of documentation that you should read, and I mean it, read it. I'm going to quiz you on some of it on Thursday, okay? So I want you to read this be between now and, and Thursday. All right, so I want to begin with some introductions here today. All right, so uh, I want you to tell me about yourselves first. I mean, there's one of me, you all get to know one of me, but I have to get to know about 36 of you this semester, give or take, okay? So I want you to raise your hand if you are interested in medical school MD programs. Yeah, lots of people, not a shock, right? This is the pre-health sequence. Most of you are gunning for medical school MDs, all right? What about MD and PhD combined programs? Anybody aiming for an MD PhD program that combines clinical work with research, okay? Uh, what about uh, dental school, other important health-related uh, activities? Yeah, right, so what are you, so you're single? Yes. Okay, excellent. I bet you're wondering how I did that. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what's your interest after college? Uh, like maxillofacial surgery. Surgery, okay, all right. And someone else, who else had their hand up? Someone else, yeah. What's your name? Lori. Lori, nice to meet you, Lori. Okay. All right, so um, what about something other than medicine? I mean, and that could be, you could be interested in doing medicine and something else, or you could just be interested in doing something other than medicine in general, yeah? Okay, uh, what's your name? Ashley. Ashley, okay, Ashley, what are you interested in? Dance. Dance. Okay, excellent. And what's your name? Jared. Jared? Jerry? Jared. Jared. Okay, well, Jared, what are you interested in? Um, patent law. Patent law. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I, I know that I have a diversity of, of people in this class. I do try to respect that. I do expect you to learn physics, but I will also try to take the sour pill that can often be physics and wrap it up in a candy coat of something you actually give a damn about, okay? So I will try to do that. That's that's my part of the contract, but your part of the contract is you have to execute what's expected of you this semester. All right, now I'm not easily offended. So how many of you dislike slash hate physics? Come on, raise your hands. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. All right, so my job as a teacher is to work on that a little bit this semester. And uh, yes? Are you just like, I still really, really hate physics? Yeah. I thought about it some more. I really hate physics. Thank you for raising your hand twice. Okay, all right. What's your name? Elizabeth. Okay, excellent. All right. See, I'm not easily offended. It's fine. Uh, you just failed the first. No, you're fine. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Whoops. I probably skipped too far. So I'm Professor Stephen Sukula. I'm an assistant, hopefully soon to be associate professor of physics in the SMU physics department. Um, I got here in 2009, and so I'm getting a little long in the tooth at this point. Um, I spend, I'm a research professor, so I only teach one class a semester, and this is it, all right? So I, when I'm devoted to teaching, I'm devoted to you this semester, all right? So that's the benefit of a research professor. The disadvantage of a research professor is I do research, and that means that I often have to commute to faraway places in order to collaborate with the 3,000 people that I work with on an experiment called ATLAS. Uh, ATLAS is one of two multi-purpose experiments that are located at a laboratory called CERN in Europe. It straddles the French-Swiss border, so it's a lovely and less expensive area now that the Euro has crashed and the Swiss franc, so that's good for research dollars. Um, so I spend part of my time there, like my graduate students are primarily there, and I can't leave them alone for that long. So there will be weeks when I have to disappear to go to meetings in the United States or meetings abroad. I will try to let you know as those come up. I tend to have to plan travel about a month or two in advance. I try to schedule exams for when those travels coincide. So there's one in March, for instance. That will be our second exam. And uh, that exam will coincide with me going to a meeting in Seattle, Washington. Okay, so the teaching assistant, whose name is Andrew Turvey, uh, will be helping out while I'm gone. And because of the style of teaching I'm going to administer this semester, you shouldn't really notice a big difference between the way, uh, well, I mean, okay, apart from that, I have a lot more experience. You shouldn't really notice a big difference between classroom styles when I'm away and when I'm not, okay? And I'll tell you why in a bit. Um, I like working with students, so these are a few undergraduates that I've worked with on research. This is Miriam Ishak, who's now 
in the MD-PhD program at UT San Antonio Health Sciences Center. She came back about a year ago now and gave a talk here in the physics department, basically advice for pre-health students about um, looking at MD or looking at MD and PhD programs. Uh, she was a physics major, she was outstanding, uh, but she really knew what she wanted, and so she did her physics major and went off to medical school, and that's fantastic. Um, this is Holly and uh, Tran. They were both in this class in 2010, I want to say, 2010, 2011. And uh, Holly is now going to medical school after a couple, couple of years of, of taking some other courses uh, elsewhere. And then finally, uh, this, is, uh, so this is some of the students, Matthew and Landon, that I worked with on research when I first got here. And behind us is my old experiment called Babar. It's only about three stories tall. In contrast, Atlas is eight stories tall. So it's a much bigger camera. And here it is. So this is where I go to work. I don't get to hang out down here very much because when this is actually running, there's a whole lot of radiation I don't want to be near. Okay, but that's a person. And that's the cavern in which my experiment is located. It is the largest digital camera ever constructed by humankind. It's an eight story, 50 yard long, 100 megapixel digital camera. And it's capable of taking 40 million pictures every second. What is it taking pictures of? We smash protons into other protons at the center of this long cylinder, and we image the collisions that come out, all the debris that comes flying out. We're essentially uh, ramping up the energy of the collisions to recreate the early cosmos about a millionth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang, and we take pictures of what happened. And from those pictures, we attempt to figure out what the laws of physics were at that time and see if they're any different than the ones that apply now. And by doing that, we learn all sorts of things about the beginning of time, what the universe is like now, and what its fate might be in the future. We also get to see the players in the cosmos at that time. Uh, most of them are subatomic particles you can't see with your eye, which is why you need all kinds of neat materials in order to actually image them in the first place. So this device is essentially creating a picture, a representation that human beings can understand uh, based on the interactions of subatomic particles in material. Uh, normally, this thing is filled with instrumentation. Here, you're just seeing the magnets. These are just the magnets in our system. All right. So you're going to learn a little bit about magnets, a little bit about electricity this semester. And what you'll find is that you learn a little bit about this stuff, and you can think about really interesting questions, really interesting problems that maybe you never thought could be solved before. Okay. All right, so that leads nicely into why the hell should you care about electricity and magnetism? All right, so for the health types in the room, physics, uh, it generally as a specialty, can seem in college as if it has nothing to do with the real world, even though it is the fundamental understanding of matter, energy, space, and time, of which all of us are made and through which all of us move, uh, it often seems disconnected from our lives. But in fact, physics and medicine go hand in hand, especially in the modern era as non-invasive imaging techniques become not only more advanced, but more important to reduce patient risks uh, and try to improve patient outcomes by catching diseases very early on before they manifest into something you actually can you know, feel as a lump or something like that. Okay? When it's gotten to that stage, it tends to be bad. If you can catch it a bit earlier, that's better for treatment. So here are a few techniques that have resulted from fundamental physics. So the magnetic resonance imaging scan, and you see a slice of a human head here using this technique, including the brain, nasal cavity, mouth, and so forth, throat, brain stem, uh, really nice detail in this. This comes from immersing a human being in a very strong magnetic field. And that magnetic field is supplied by something called a superconducting magnet. The superconducting magnets were developed by my field for bending particles in circles. That's it. We wanted to bend particles in circles and make them go around so that you didn't have to keep accelerating them along like 50 kilometer racetracks, which is a huge waste of space. So uh, my field developed these and then they were exported to other industries because once you have a magnet that uses superconducting technology that is very little resistance to the flow of electricity, that has all kinds of neat applications in industry and medicine. And one of those is MRIs. So the reason that most major hospitals now have at least one MRI machine, the reason why there are portable MRI machines, is because physicists were able to cram a really strong magnetic field into a very tiny space, and industry developed that into something that's patient-safe and user-friendly and mobile. Okay? Uh, it, basically what this thing does is by blasting the human body with radio waves when you're in the magnetic field, it forces all the little spins in your protons to flip back and forth. And looking at the frequency of the flips, you can figure out what material that little region of your body is made from. 
And so you can look for normal material and you can look for anomalous material, material that's not supposed to be there. Uh, here is another example of a technology that's a byproduct of fundamental physics. This is something called the PET scan. How many people have heard of the PET scan? Anyone? Yeah? A anyone ever had one or know someone that had one? Yeah, it's a fairly common thing these days, more common than it used to be. Basically what happens is, is that, uh, we won't study this in this class, but I'll mention it because it's cool. Uh, you get injected with a radioisotope that emits antimatter. Antimatter, when it meets matter, does what? Does anybody know from science fiction or other means? Yeah, boom, right? Now, it's pretty dramatic. You watch like sci-fi, Star Trek, something like that, and any time they have to eject the warp core, that thing really goes. Like in the Abrams Star Trek movie from 09, when they blow the warp core at the end to get away from the black hole. Yeah, I'm a nerd, okay? So <laughs> just deal with it, all right? Uh, you know, that's, that's like a tremendous release of energy that warps space-time, and then they're able to surf out of the black hole. This is a bit less dramatic than that. This is like a radioisotope that every now and then emits an anti-electron, and that, your body's made of lots and lots of electrons. Uh, so it's bound to hit somewhere nearby an electron, and when they meet, they turn into two particles of light. And that light travels out of the body. It's basically X-rays or gamma rays. And you put a big detector around the body, and then you can figure out by doing a little geometry where the light came from in the body, and you can pinpoint where the radioisotope was collected at that time. It follows the path of blood. So you can, ten you can use this to identify regions of large or obstructed blood flow in the body. All right, so for instance, this is the, the distribution of the radioisotope due to blood distribution in the brain in what's considered a normal brain. This is a, uh, this is a person who is um, uh, you know, pre some treatment suffering from Parkinson's disease and you see that there's a greatly restricted blood flow in various regions of the brain compared to a normal brain. And then this is post some treatment that the patient was given, so probably some experimental drug or some new approved drug on the market, and you can see that blood flow activity has increased. Didn't have to cut open the brain to figure this out. That's a good thing because cutting into the brain is really risky. And then you can combine these techniques. You can combine MRIs and PET scans to get all kinds of information about blood flow, material distribution, and so forth. Uh, there's also now functional MRI imaging, which is real-time MRI imaging. So you can actually watch changes in the body as they happen. All right. So this is all a relationship between physics and medicine that's evolved over decades and is to the benefit of patients now. And so what I always say is that you know, physics is the fundamental study of energy, matter, space, and time. It's about asking curious curiosity-driven basic questions about the universe and then trying to find answers to those questions. And you never know how it's going to pay off. You might have to invent some new technology to answer the question. You might have to do some calculation that no one's done before to answer the question or both. And inevitably that spins off into the world around us. Uh, the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web exists because particle physicists at CERN wanted to share papers. And now it's a platform on which hundreds of billions of dollars of commerce happens every day. All right. The World Wide Web was invented by CERN. And now everybody uses it. Okay, so you never know. You never know when something is going to be uh, beneficial that spins off from just curiosity. And so what I want to teach you in this course is, is how to use curiosity to turn that into action. All right, so physics is about turning curiosity and questions into action. It also has some useful side effects. So for instance, this is data collected by the American Institute of Physics, which is one of the organizations that does a lot of statistical analysis of teaching and outcomes and so forth for the field. And one of the things they looked at, ranked by the uh, average sc total score on the MCAT, was if you major in physics, how do you rank against other people with, in other majors? So for instance, here's biology down here. Physics is up here, okay? Yeah, right, but let's take a look at the breakdown. So average biology scores on the physical sciences, no big surprise, are a bit lower in, on average than if you major in something like engineering or physics, uh, mathematics, uh, neuroscience, right? Okay, where you, you're just gonna get more physical science, uh, biomedical engineering. You're gonna get more physical science in a, in a program like that. All right, uh, but just straight biology, you may not be required to take physics or lots of physics or engineering and so forth. And so physical sciences score tend to get dragged down by that. But what's also interesting is that the biological sciences scores are a little bit lower on average in you know, majors like psychology, biology, and, and so forth compared to physics. Uh, of course, verbal reasoning English majors are off the charts, which is what you'd expect. That was my control. If this wasn't true, then I weep for uh, our species. But I'm glad to see that English majors do the best on verbal reasoning in the MCAT. Okay. 
So yeah, the MCAT's evolving as an exam, but the takeaway message from this is it never hurts to get a little bit more physical science in your life because physical sciences are about, in general, and that goes for biology too, okay? They are about uh, setting up and solving hard problems. And in physics, you will learn to set up and solve hard problems. And you will use the language that nature appears to respect, mathematics, to do it. Okay, I would love it if math could be used to pass a language requirement in the new undergraduate curriculum, but that's a losing battle, we found out at SMU. We'll try again in a few years, okay? So other institutions allow that. Okay, uh, if you care about money, if you major in something like physics, the range of salaries uh, coming out of college offered by recruiters spans something like, uh, what is that, 40K up to about 62K or so, uh, you know, something like that, okay? Uh, ostensibly money-making majors like marketing don't have quite the high end of the range that people with a physics degree uh, get coming out uh, offered by recruiters, but that, you know, whatever, that's a big spread, so. Uh, I just encourage people to find something they're interested in and then do it really well. That's all that really matters, okay? So if you're passionate about science, do science. Um, just out of a curious, a curious thing that we've been doing is collecting statistics on our own program, looking at BS and BA uh, recipients from physics. And, you, you know, naively you'd expect, well, everybody who gets a BS or BA in physics goes into physics. And actually, nationally, that's just not true. Uh, and it's also not true at SMU. Most of our students uh, are part of dual, dual degree programs with engineering, so something like 37% of our graduates go into engineering, not a big surprise. But what I thought was interesting was about 16% go into finance, business, and marketing. Only 13% go into some physics-related thing. Uh, I lumped medical physics under medicine because it's, there's more medicine involved than just physics, uh, but that's a roughly equivalent number of people that get degrees in our program go off to medicine and physics other natural sciences like chemistry, and then we have some, you know, occasional students that go into law, uh, one went to seminary, uh, art, music, and design, and education. So we have a mix of students in our own major program. They're not all going into physics, and so when I teach, I try to keep that in mind, that not everybody that comes through a physics class is going to be a physicist, and that certainly applies to most of you, okay? All right, so why should you care about physics? Because it's everywhere. It is quite literally everywhere. It is present at the beginning of time, it's present now, and it lets us understand the evolution of the universe and maybe ultimately its fate. Uh, every time you tap on a touch screen device, that's physics, that's circuits, that's capacitors that we're going to learn about this semester, it's resistors, it's light, it's optics, it's all the stuff that we're going to try to cover this semester, at least in some level. Uh, the, the humble light bulb is, is just a wealth of physics uh, information, and we'll play around with some of them this semester. The GPS system, so the fact that you can use your mobile phone now to figure out where you are and where you're going and how to get there, all of that is made possible by something called Einstein's theory of relativity. How many of you have heard of Albert Einstein before? Okay, He's one of the more famous physicists in the history of the field. And he came up with a beautiful, very simple understanding that still works to this day, as far as we can tell, of space and time as a single entity. Without that simple realization, the GPS system would lose accuracy by 11 kilometers every day. So if we didn't understand space and time as a single entity through which we move, then we would have put satellites up into orbit, started trying to triangulate our position on Earth, and every day been off by 11 kilometers, even if you just stood still. One, the next day you'd be 11 kilometers over there, the next day you'd be 11 kilometers over there, and we'd just keep drifting. And it all comes from, fixing that comes from a very fundamental understanding of the universe. Uh, MRIs I've covered, the, the fact that you have all of these beautiful bonds and bonding uh, mechanisms that make up living organisms, at its heart, that's all physics. It's, it's fundamentally, it's Coulomb's law, which you're going to start learning about this week. Uh, the pumping of the heart. The heart is a huge muscle, but it's powered by a, a really regular and predictable electrical system. And it's when that system becomes irregular and unpredictable that you have problems. All right, You never want to get into that state. The eye is really an amazing piece of optics, uh, although terribly flawed in certain ways. And I'm hoping we'll have a lecture at the end of the semester on the human eye that, uh, that we can we take a look at. And of course, you live here in North Texas for most of the time. Uh, lightning, lightning and thunderstorms are a fantastic electrical and magnetic phenomena. And we'll study that a little bit uh, as we go through the, the course, okay? So uh, let, me, uh, let me back up here. So just to show you kind of the synergy of uh, It'll be interesting to see if this actually works. The synergy of uh, physics and medicine. Let me show you just a piece of a short video here. 
You know, we're not. It's a division of the Cancer Institute okay. at Greenwich Hospital. We use the latest technology along with highly skilled... Oh, I bet I know what it is. Yeah. Uh, let's go back one more time. This is called People Messing With My Stuff. Ew. Ew. All right, let's try this now. Victory. The Radiation Therapy Department is a division of the Cancer Institute at Greenwich Hospital. We use the latest technology along with highly skilled and trained board certified staff. The Radiation Therapy Department was designed with the patient in mind with calming, soothing music, colors, furniture, constantly embracing the patient during the course of their treatment. The radiation therapy team is comprised of a number of specialists. Uh, a physician who helps determine the clinical need for radiation and essentially helps map out the target of the radiation therapy, the tumor, and the, the cancer cells. This is followed by the physicists who are in charge of quality assurance, we making do. sure that the treatment machine is delivering the radiation as planned. The nursing staff who assist patients with any potential side effects and the therapists who are involved with daily positioning of the patient to ensure that the radiation is delivered precisely. I am the nurse in the radiation oncology department. I see all patients when they initially come in for their radiation treatments and I follow them throughout treatment. I see my role as a patient advocate, empowering them to get through treatment with as little side effects as possible. Cancer is very frightening and what we try to do here is bring more comfort to the patient through a lot of support. I've been a radiation therapist for 18 years and I wouldn't want to do anything else. I love working with the patients, I love the technology, it never gets boring, and just the feeling of knowing that every day you've done something for that patient to make their life better is the best feeling in the world. A medical physicist is sure the safe and effective delivery of radiation treatment to patients as prescribed by the radiation oncologist. We work very closely with radiation oncologists to produce a computer-generated dose distribution plan which ensures the best treatment for each patient. The Novalis TX has abilities to focus in on the tumor beyond the capacities of other radiation machines. It allows us to attack the tumor cells while sparing the normal tissue. It allows us to precisely target tumors in the body, even in locations where the tumor could move. The patient has more precise radiation treatment delivery, fewer side effects, and sometimes shorter treatment times. Okay, so let me let me pause it there. But no, I was driving uh, in Long Island for some meeting, and this ad came on the radio. It was for Greenwich Hospital, and they were advertising that they had they were the first to have the certain class of linear accelerator in the nation in a hospital. It's like who. Who says linear accelerator in an ad for patients? That's mm -hmm. jargon from my field. That's not radio ad quality material, but there it was. So I browsed their website and found that video, and they very proudly, you know, they very proudly, in their propaganda piece, advertise the fact that you have the medical expert, the supporting staff, the nurse that actually works most directly with the patient, and the physicists all working together to do these treatments that are very difficult and scary for patients. Uh, I've worked with several medical physicists just on the side. Uh, they're an interesting group of people. They don't think the same way that my field thinks. They have problems that actually, if they screw up, involve killing people. No one's going to die if I do a bad calculation. But someone could die if they misjudge the breathing rate of the patient if the tumor is by a lung uh, while they're putting the dose treatment plan together using a computer simulation. Okay, so they're either writing software, implementing mathematics, or they're using off-the-shelf programs to try to come up with a dose plan, taking into account the fact that that patient might move because they need to breathe while the beam is firing. Okay? And you, the goal with radiation therapy is never put radiation somewhere it's not supposed to go. Because anytime you do that, you kill good tissue and you fail to kill the tissue that's bad. All right? So these are very delicate issues. They involve life and death. And uh, I think it's fascinating that physicists get to play a part in that of any kind, even if it's small. All right. So the other reason that, uh, that I find electricity and magnetism kind of a fascinating subject is something I think we forget about. If we don't think about it daily, we ought to. Uh, there are a lot of diseases 
that have to do in the human body with disruptions of the electrical systems of the body in one way or another. And it's a reminder when, you're, when you see things like I'm about to show you here that we are electromagnetic beings. We are not immune from the laws of physics. We obey them just like everything else. And everything, all our thought processes, our vision, our hearing, our ability to speak, all of these are controlled by an under, underlying electrical system, memory, and so forth. And so this is just a nice reminder that it's a delicate balance. At any moment, any one of us is, is inches away from falling off the precipice of all this stuff firing in the right sequence. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great problem. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together <laughs> again. It's a magnet. Placed at the right location on the brain, pulsed, and it disrupts the uh, electrical currents in the brain. And in this case, it knocks out the speech center. All right. Now, what's cool about this is that uh, some of you probably already know this, but the center of the brain that we use for speaking and the center of the brain that we use for singing are not the same. And so there's, I'll probably show this video later in the semester when we come back to magnetic induction, uh, which is basically what's going on here. It's uh, disruption of electrical systems by magnetic fields. Uh, you can sing Humpty Dumpty, but you can't speak it with that magnet pulsing. So he can still sing it. He can add a tune to it and turn it into a song, which he does. But when he tries to say it just flat, no singing involved, he can have his speech center knocked out. It's pretty wild, okay? So inches. All of us are inches away from some magnet mishap somewhere in a building that just knocks out your speech center or changes the color of your vision, okay? It's, uh, it's, it's <laughs> tough to be reminded of that, right? That we're frail, <laughs> okay? But, but I want you to learn a little bit of physics. I want you to learn a little bit of respect for the frailty of our condition because we are slave to the same laws that all things in the cosmos are slave to, all right? Uh, let's see, value added. So some of you should have this flyer. Uh, this happened last semester for the first time. It's continuing again this semester. If you weren't part of this last semester, you can talk to the instructors who I believe are Professor Federalness for this semester. Um, actually, there's an email address if you have questions. We have a zero credit hour honors section. It appears if you pass the section, it's one night a week that it meets. And there's a light a bit of work that goes along with that. Uh, Emily, you were in that last semester, right? And are you in it again this semester? Uh, yes. OK, great. So uh, how much homework was there? Um, honestly, not much to the end. OK, all right. So it was kind of light, as Semi promised. OK, all right. So it's mostly a chance to get outside the classroom and, and kind of engage with faculty and other researchers and other students that may have interests uh, that, that go beyond just the basic stuff you're going to learn in a course like this. So it's a chance to kind of get together and hear some interesting stuff and find out how physics is connected to other things. So this week, Professor Fred Olmus is going to give an inaugural spring lecture on Wednesday night, so this is tomorrow night, called Alan Turing, The Imitation Game, The Enigma Pirate Codes in Monte Carlos. And if you want to know what the hell that's about, you can go tomorrow, <laughs> okay? So you can contact, uh, there's an email address or a phone number for contacting uh, with questions, or you can drop by the main office. It's just down the hall in 102, uh, just down that way. And, uh, and ask if, if uh, you know, how you sign up for it, if you're interested in it, you just want to test, test drive it this week, go ahead and test drive it. There may be pizza for the first meeting, I was told, uh, but no promises on that. That's, um, that's, something, that's something I always want to watch out for, is I don't know if there's actually going to be pizza or not. There was pizza mentioned in the email, but I, if it's not on the flyer, then it's not law. So it's like, if it's not on the syllabus, it's not law, okay? Any questions about that? Of course, you can also talk to Emily if you have questions. Was anyone else? Uh, James, you were in that last semester. So Emily and James, anyone else was in the honors section last semester? Yep, okay. So, um, and what's your name again? Gloria. Gloria, okay. All right, it takes me at least three tries. All right. Okay, so uh, let me talk about the course. So all of this you can follow along with on the syllabus if you really want to. I'm not going to read this word for word. I'm going to give you the, the broad, broad brush picture, okay? So, of course, there's the university curriculum, and I have to put these SLOs uh, on here. So go ahead and read those. They're all boilerplate. They all match up with this course in one way or another, moving on, okay? What are the actual goals of this course? Uh, I want you to be able to explain the nature of electrical and magnetic phenomena, okay? So I want you to understand what is electric charge. 
what is the force between electric charges? How is it described? What consequences does it have? Uh, we're going to come back to something that you should have seen in the first semester. You learned about gravitational fields. We're going to come back to the field concept. It's a very useful concept for explaining forces that don't involve physical contact. And in fact, as far as we can tell, the field concept works all the way down into the subatomic realm, uh, giving us a picture of the most fundamental interactions in nature, the stuff that happens way below where we can actually see it directly. Um, uh, then there'll be a corresponding, as there's a gravitational potential energy, there's an electric potential energy, an electric potential, uh, and all of this will be needed to kind of understand electrical phenomena. And then we want to get, get charge moving. So we want to start moving it through things and getting it to do mechanical work. Uh, in the same way that water moving through a pipe can do mechanical work in your plumbing system and power a generator or move a paddle wheel or something like that, el electrons and other charges moving through uh, piping for them called conductors, and I'll play around with a conductor in a bit today, uh, they are able to do mechanical work by smashing into other things and generating heat and light and all kinds of other neat stuff. So we're going to learn about basic electrical circuitry, conductors, batteries, resistors, capacitors, all right, words you may have heard before. We're going to play around with them a little bit this semester. Uh, I want you to be able to explain the nature of magnetism. Just what the heck is magnetism caused by? Um, and then I really want you to be able to describe the magnetic phenomena, how it behaves, what are the forces involved. And then finally, we'll have kind of a very broad lecture on light and how light connects to these other concepts. And finally, I want you to be able to understand the basic working of simple optical systems. I want you to finally be able to explain, and hopefully we'll have a little bit capstone thing at the end, uh, how does electricity, magnetism, and light set the stage for the 20th century revolution that we're really still living through today? A lot of things happened at the beginning, let's say the first quarter to first half of the 20th century, and we're still reeling from the consequences of that today. There's just as much fundamental physics, just as much curiosity about the universe today as there was then. Uh, there are many mysteries right now about exactly how the cosmos operates and what are the big players in the cosmos. Um, and those will no doubt set the stage for similar revolutions in the 21st and 22nd centuries. Uh, we're living through that now. This is a very exciting time for physics. There has not been a time like this since Albert Einstein did his work in 1905. Okay. And then finally, um, I want you to be able to set up and solve quantitative problems in these areas described here and be able, basically, I want you to be able to apply these ideas. I want you to show me that given a situation, you can work your way through that situation using the principles of physics and the language of mathematics. Those go hand in hand. Uh, and I also want you to understand how to apply these ideas to areas other than physics, such as medicine, biology, chemistry, electronics, everyday life. Okay. And then finally, I want you to demonstrate through performance on homework and quizzes, in-class exercises and discussions and exams, a clear understanding of the principles and application of electricity, magnetism, light, and optics. And I'll get to what I mean a little bit more about that in a second. All right, so what's the structure of the course? Well, you're here now. You're in class. This is an in-class period. Uh, most of them won't be like this. Uh, the in-class periods are going to be used to work with you as individuals and as groups to set up and solve problems in physics. This semester, I'm trying something called the flipped classroom. And the flipped classroom firmly puts the burden of learning on the student, which is where it's always been anyway, but now we're really kind of like doubling down on that, all right? So in class, you'll have quizzes on the readings and lecture videos that were assigned in the previous class. You'll have to do problem solving. And uh, one of the things we've been missing from this course for a long time is a clear demonstration to the whole class of how one even begins to set up and solve physics problems. I have never been able to do that in class because I have all this lecture material I want to cover and I have demonstrations I want to do. I'm mixing it up this semester. There will be a little bit of lecture and some demonstrations in class, but mostly I want you guys to interact. And so I will show you how to set up problems. I will give you problems to start working. When people get stuck, I want everyone to stop. I want us to discuss the, the sticking point and then see how to get past it. And I'm hoping that by doing this, you'll get more practical, hands-on engagement in the physics ideas that you've been reading about or watching on YouTube videos, okay? Uh, demonstrations are often best done in person. I will try to do a couple today. Uh, so there, there may be, uh, I'll probably cut them out of the lecture videos and then and save, that will save time on the lecture videos. And then of course, discussion. I want you to feel free to ask questions. If you're not sure about something that you read, I want to talk about it. I want to use the class as an interactive period, not just me chalk talking like I'm doing now. Okay, a modern chalk, I have slides, boring. 
okay? I'm trying not to lecture to you, I'm trying to work with you so that we can learn this physics together and get through the hard stuff together and you can draw from each other's strengths because all of you have strengths and the key is that each of you needs to find what the strengths of the other people near you are and work together to solve problems. That's how the real world works and so I want to emulate that as much as possible in a college class, right? There will be assigned reading and lecture videos, all right, and uh, I will show you the, the web page for the class in a second. Uh, those will, they're all laid out on the web page already. Okay, so all you have to do is look at the, uh, the class material site on the course website. I'll show you where that is. And uh, it's all there. All right, so you can start now. There will be assigned homework roughly every week. But, um, you know, sometimes just given because we'll have exams and stuff like that, it may be one assignment over two weeks or something like that. So that will get mixed up a little bit as time goes on. Uh, there will be four exams total. I like to spot check all of you as frequently as I can. So they're once a month. Uh, the first one will be in, in uh, February, because this is a short month. The next one will be in March. The third one will be in April. And then we'll have our final exam on May 7th, I believe, at 8 in the morning in this class. Hooray for morning exams. Now, uh, previously in this course, I've given a cumulative final exam. That will no longer be the case, because to assess you globally across the material in the course, I've introduced a new feature to the course. The final exam will merely be incremental and only the material that we talked about since exam three that wasn't covered on exam three. Uh, and it will also include uh, material from something called the Grand Challenge Physics Problem, which I'll get to in a moment. And then, of course, there will be help sessions and office hours. Um, I'll get to office hours in a second. Okay? All right, so lectures. Oh, lectures. These are really class periods. Tuesdays, Thursdays, this time, this place. Uh, the style, as I said, will be quizzes near the beginning of class. I'll do a little uh, exposition at the beginning to give people that are coming from far across campus or something like that some time to roll in, maybe a couple of minutes late. But probably by you know 9.35, we'll start the quiz. I'm guessing they'll be about 10 minutes in length, and then we'll move on to problem solving and demonstrations and things like that. Um, so uh, every non-exam period, so the classes will be during class, the exams will be during class periods. We'll have uh, quizzes on assigned reading from the previous uh, lecture day and lecture video material. Okay, so they'll be short, simple questions. You either know it or you don't. You read it, you watched it, or you didn't. Okay, so you know, don't don't fake it. If you didn't, just save yourself the effort. These are quizzes are worth five percent of your total grade. Okay, you're going to have like. 30-something of these, so just relax. <laughs> and I dropped the lowest two, so please don't freak out. Okay, if you miss a quiz, if you have an excused absence, by the way, and I have a whole policy for, of course, you know, official university excused absences, but if you're, if you're barfing on your roommate because you have a norovirus, please don't come to class, all right? All right, you know, I dodged a norovirus over the Christmas break, but I had to take care of a very sick spouse for 20, 12 hours, and and I hate it when people get me sick. So don't come to class. Don't get your friends sick. Don't get your peers sick. Stay home. There will be lecture videos. Uh, you know, when things need to be recorded, I will record them like it's happening now. Uh, you've, you know, multiple cameras and so forth to use here. If the setups are reliable, then it all works great. Uh, or just come and talk to me after class and find out what you missed. All right, there. Talk, talk to a friend in the class. But if you're sick, just let me know. Um, I'll know if you're faking being sick all the time. It'll be pretty obvious that you're never showing up to class because you always have the flu or Ebola or, you know, <laughs> some kind of whooping leprosy or something like that. So I'll, I'll know. I'll I'm not stupid. I can see patterns, okay? Um, I'll do demonstrations in class because some stuff is just more fun and threatening in real life. Uh, there'll be opportunities for discussion and, of course, problem solving how to set up and solve problems because that's really what I need you to be able to do. All right. Uh, reading, the pace will be about one chapter every one to two weeks. Uh, the first chapter is a little bit light, so we're going to finish that basically between now and Thursday. I basically expect you to spend four hours outside of class periods reading and watching lecture videos. I'm serious about that, okay? I will not always try to assign up to four hours because that's crazy, but I do expect that, you know, if you're, let me put it this way, if you're spending less than an hour a week on reading and lecture videos, you're either not watching all the lecture videos or not doing any of the reading or both, okay? So, and if you're struggling, let me know and we'll see if we can figure out a, a, some kind of, you know, strategy for, for getting through this, all right? Please take notes as you do these activities because these notes you should bring to class and if you have questions, you should ask them. If something wasn't clear in the reading, you should ask. I want you to take this time with the book and the videos as real like reading, learning time, okay? So find a quiet spot, put your headphones on, and just lose yourself in the science, all right? 
Uh, please read your notes before coming to class. They may help you with the quiz. All right. So the assessment of all of this is, as I said, these reading and video lecture quizzes. They're worth 5% of your final grade. I use them to check your pace and comprehension. They're in class near the beginning of, of each class, again, to give people time to get here from across campus. Do try to get here on time, though, because when I start it, the clock is ticking. Okay? And if that's going to be a problem, getting here by, let's say, 935, please speak to me and let me know. Uh, the two lowest reading quiz grades are automatically dropped. All right, so don't be shy about missing one of those or bombing one of them. It's okay. All right. Uh, homework. This is now worth 10% of your final grade. I expect you to spend about four hours outside of class working on homework. Uh, because we're going to be doing things in class to learn to set up and solve problems, I'm hoping that that will help to mitigate a lot of the office hour learning that seemed to be going on in previous semesters I've taught this class. I'm very generous with my time, usually, uh, outside of class. And I think that means that people don't spend a lot of time uh, sitting down and trying to figure out how to do the homework themselves. So I'm going to try to force your hand on that by actually making you do homework style problems with me in class. Okay. This will be assigned weekly through Wiley Plus. So um, I'll show you the course website. There's a link to our Wiley Plus course page. You, did you have Wiley Plus the first semester? Okay, so you all should have codes. Those codes are still good. So you can just use those codes, register for my section, all good to go. If you don't have a code, you can register on the site and buy one. I really recommend you just get the digital only copy of everything because it's generally cheaper as a bundle and um, you don't have to worry about reselling the textbook, which we may not even use in another year or two anyway. Okay. Uh, and the, I'm going to have the system assess your answers on your homework and I'm going to have the teaching assistant assess your methods for solving problems. So uh, you'll get homework assigned primarily through Wildly Plus. It's due Thursdays by 9.30 a.m. So it's assigned on a Thursday. Typically, it's due on a Thursday. Answers are submitted in Wildly Plus. But I expect you to make good quality written solutions to every problem as if it was going to be graded. Because randomly, the teaching assistant will pick one of the problems from your homework and grade that on form. Did you write? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Do we have to um, type it into the Wiley Plus system? Or no, paper? no. Into Wiley Plus, you enter only numerical answers. I don't like the whole let's enter a bunch of symbols into Wiley Plus business. No, that's what teaching assistants are for. So, I mean, human beings are still better at that stuff, entering it, and writing it, and reading it than computers. So I would prefer to take advantage and save you the time. All right. So yes, you should be writing up good written solutions in pen or pencil as you go. Um, so I have a homework and quiz policy. I used to give more numerical quizzes. I tend to give more concept quizzes now. But nonetheless, this is what I expect from you. And I have a link to an example on the website of a good quality written solution. What should that look like from a previous student who generously donated their solution? Okay. So uh, I expect good quality written solutions. Uh, you know, in English classes, uh, they they think that they're the only ones that are the arbiters of structure and content and form and method nonsense. In science, it's just as important to be able to tell a story with math as it is to do it in any other area of, of life. And I expect you to get good at writing good, clear, linear solutions with words explaining things that need explaining and otherwise using good handwriting and written equations and step by step because the teaching assistant is going to look at what steps you put down. And if you have, you know, equation number one, Equation number two, answer. What I joke is the, the, uh, the, there was a, a magical operation in, in there called a miracle occurred. And you get no credits for miracles. I want to see what you did between equation one, equation two, and final answer. And the teaching assistant will grade accordingly. Okay? And if your written solutions are suffering, then I want to talk to you because we need to figure out a strategy for you to make that better. All right? So half of your homework grade, five of that 10%, will come from just getting the numerical answers right that are assigned to you. Okay? The other half comes from a full assessment of your solution, not the answer, the process. All right? So the teaching assistant will not grade you on your numerical answer. You don't get dinged for that twice. You could get zero on the numerical answer because you were one decimal place off because of a calculator error, and 100% from the teaching assistant because your process was fine, but you just had a calculator barf at the end, right? So you got to get in the habit of double checking and triple checking your calculator methodology. I'd say seven times out of 10 last semester and in previous semesters, it was just punching things into a calculator in the wrong order. Otherwise, everything was fine and the student was totally stressed for no reason, okay? So 
Um, build a tense but understanding relationship with your calculator. Don't trust that thing. Uh, trust but verify. That would be my advice with a calculator. Okay? It's like that friend that's going to stab you in the back at the worst possible moment. That's what calculators are. Right? Okay, so exams. As I said, there are four per semester. They're in class. They're 80 minutes long, so they, full, they fill the class period. And they each cover a specific subset of topics. And they're each worth 15% of your final grade. So exams are worth 60% total of your final grade. Okay? So we've got 60, 5, and 10. What's the remaining 25%? Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, comprehensive physics knowledge will be assessed separately in another method. So the final exam is not cumulative. It merely covers material that wasn't covered on exam three. That's different from previous semesters. Okay. The grand challenge. So you should all have a form and a problem. All right. The problem is the same for everybody in the class. And I'll just read it out loud. This is an open-ended, non-textbook problem. Okay? There is no textbook answer to this question. So you have to think. You have to be creative. You have to invent. And then you have to calculate. A patient, bored before their MRI exam, rubs their feet aggressively on the shag carpet of the waiting room. Shag carpet? In the waiting room is this. Also a bit nervous, they unconsciously scratch at the small, dark blue circular tattoo on their left arm. Soon after, they are placed in an MRI machine. Describe at least three interesting things that could happen to this patient when the MRI machine is turned on. Okay? Now, you can Google, and in fact, I encourage you to Google if you're confused about what, where to start on this. That's perfectly fine. But what I want you to take away from the policy on this is that any source that you use to get inspiration, any, whether it's a person, a website, whatever, start keeping notes about what you looked at. I want you to start documenting your sources, all right? At you as an individual, all right? This, the answer to this, okay, and you have to identify three things that could happen to this patient and document them with mathematics and numbers as needed. Uh, it's due no later than 5 p.m. on the last day of classes. All right, so you have from basically next week, officially, to the last week of classes to work on this piecemeal through the whole semester. It will seem overwhelming at first, but there is a structure involved. And you can please, 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 please read the Grand Challenge instructions to see what I envision for this to help you, okay? It's a group exercise. Random groups will be constructed in week two. That's after the ad drop date. Uh, I want you to give your team a name. Uh, please, uh, how did I say this now? I want it to be something polite and non-offensive. I was, I was very politic in my way of saying it. Oh yeah, choose a name for your team. Be creative, but also polite and respectful with your choice. Make sure everyone on the team agrees with it, okay? All right, so you'll work in teams of, we'll see how many people are left after Friday, but let's say five to six people, okay? I expect you to meet as a team outside, pick a time, pick a restaurant, whatever, pick a cafeteria. Uh, you don't have to meet for very long. 15, 20 minutes, and otherwise you can just ignore each other's presence and text or whatever for the rest of the time. But I really want you to meet, it's what I do when I'm in a group situation, what do you do, all right? Um, I want you to meet outside of class as a group and just talk. How did that week's lecture material maybe get the juices flowing on a possible thing, bad or otherwise, that might happen to this poor patient when the MRI machine is turned on, okay? And I've dropped a few clues in there about directions you could go in, but you are free to go in any direction you want with this. That's the beauty of this. You can take the little clues about the shag carpet and the tattoo if you want. That's up to you. But if you would rather go, I wonder what happens to the protons in this person's body, go for it. Just have at it, okay? It's perfectly fine. Anything is fair game as long as it can be physically defended and justified. So I want you to think of this as sort of combining rhetoric with physics. You're going to come up with a bunch of ideas, but you need to defend them. And you need to defend them using physics and math. I expect you to write words, too but I expect you to show me that your words have meaning by using mathematics, okay? Um, I know, group exercises. Oh, great, I'm going to be graded as a group. Yes and no. 80% of your grade will be the grade that your group gets on the write-up. 20% of your grade on this will come from questions that are given to the members of the team that handed in that write-up on the final about the write-up. Because I want to know that each and every person basically understands what was in that write-up. I don't want one person to be pulling all the damn weight and the rest of you to be doing nothing, okay? 
and no doubt I'm going to get an earful about that anyway during the semester. Oh, so and so is not showing up at the meetings, and then we'll have a little talk with so and so. Okay. So, so uh, the nice thing about this is there's group shame, which is great, right? And then there's there's professor shame, which is even better. So uh, I expect everyone to pull their weight in some way. And there's very clear instructions. You know, I, there's a a title page for the write-up, a collaboration page, you name your teammates, and then you list their contributions next to it. This is what we do in physics. So why should it be, I mean, this is what all scientists do. You have collaborators, you list what they did, okay? In medicine, you do the same thing. Uh, so, you know, you'll have an alphabetical author list for your team name, and then what they did, and then the write-up that everybody contributes to. Uh, I'll talk about this more next week, but I want the teams to pick an editor, a lead editor. That person's job is to really collect everything into a document. They don't have to do all the writing. You should delegate, okay? But, you know, there's some tips in here, like pro tip, use a collaborative editing system like Google Docs or whatever Microsoft's Skynet thing is or whatever, so SkyCloud, uh, whatever you like, okay? Use, use what's convenient for you to, uh, to get some work done. All right, so um, I expect you to synthesize work from the first semester with work from this semester. Now, we're going to learn as we go, so you might not have any ideas right now about where to go with this. That's cool. It's fine. I don't expect you to have three answers in the first day. Uh, but I do expect you to pay attention as we go through the material and reflect back on the question and then think of anything that week might be helpful for getting to some solution. Okay? I'm also going to provide you with an, a written, an example of how I expect the written solution to look. Uh, I'm still kind of working on that because I'm writing it alone. I don't have a team to rely on here. Uh, but I picked another question that I didn't give you guys. I'm going to try to answer it. So um, the question I'm looking at is, what happens if all the electrons in the solar system suddenly move to the sun? Explain three consequences of this. Okay. So uh, the first thing I have to do is calculate how many electrons there are in the solar system. And I didn't realize how difficult that was going to be. So I'm still working on that. All right. Um, it's okay. I'm going to teach you about approximations this semester, too. <laughs> Uh, I will check you once per month. So we're going to meet, me and each of your teams, we're going to meet, we're going to talk, you guys are going to tell me where you're getting stuck, you're going to tell me I don't understand this problem, I'm totally lost, I hate this class, fine. We'll just get that out of our systems and then we'll see if we can find a way forward, okay? And again, I want you to see the handout for full details on this. This is a new feature for the class. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. I think it's going to be better than having a big cumulative final that you're all scared to study for. You can work on this piecemeal through the entire semester, and, it, and I expect you to draw from three different areas of the course. I don't expect you to do all, you know, uh, electrons, and then more electrons, and then something else happens with electrons. I want you to do this, something electrical that happens, something magnetic that happens, maybe this magnetic phenomenon or that electrical phenomenon, and then kind of pick your way through it, and then come up with three things that might happen to this poor patient when that machine is turned on. And nothing is not an acceptable answer, okay? Unless you can defend it, all right? So, any questions on that? All right, well, you'll all go home and then go, ah, like, in about an hour, okay, and then realize what I've just asked you to do, all right? So, don't get stuck. Get help. Uh, I have office hours. Monday to, how, okay, how many people can make Monday 2 to 3 p.m.? All right, let's do it this way. How many people cannot make Monday 2 to 3 p.m.? Raise your hand. Hi. Hi, 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 hi. Okay. How many people, of the people with their hands raised, keep your hands up, hands up, hands up. How many people cannot make Wednesday 11 to noon? Put your hand, keep your hands up if you can't make it. Okay, so I think I got a majority of people. Uh, the teaching assistant is also going to arrange office hours and we'll likely do this by poll, okay? So the poll, I will send out to the whole class, but I, at first I would like people who can't make any of my office hours to respond to the poll for the teaching assistant and then we can have other people kind of uh, lump in, right? So I'm gonna expect you to be honest. I'll explain what I expect in an email to all of you. All right, so the TA-led help sessions will be announced. My office is very tiny for any of you that have ever seen it before. I cannot possibly fit all of you in my office, even just the people that raise their hands. The varsity is where I like to have my office hours. So I just pick a table, and then it's just a nice place where you don't got to spread out and sit down, okay? So I find it's much more relaxed, and my colleagues tend not to drop in and think that they're owed a chat with me. You know, when I'm meeting with a student, I'm meeting with a student but my colleagues expect me to interrupt what I'm doing. So if I go to the varsity, they leave me alone. This is great. So you help me, I help you. How's that sound? We'll go to the varsity and we'll, we'll talk physics. Uh, there's also, of course, the Learning Enhancement Center. It's in 20, I think it's still in 202 Lloyd. Uh, that's the northwest corner of Ford Stadium behind Meadows Art Museum. There's a link there in the slides, which I'll post uh, after the lecture. Physics tutors are available. Uh, they often are drawn from our physics majors or minors. They tend to be excellent. 
So if there isn't a physics tutor, let me know, and I'll talk to the director of undergraduate studies, and we'll see what we can get set up. Okay? Uh, and of course, you can always get a private tutor. There are physics majors and minors who might be interested in taking cash and teaching physics. As long as they don't have a conflict of interest, it's okay for them to do that. So the TA can't be your tutor, can't take money from you. All right, don't let them do that. <laughs> Hungry little graduate students. We pay them. They should know better. All right, so, all right, so here's what a typical week will probably look like. I didn't list the four hours of stuff outside of class and the four hours of homework out of class. But on Friday, what I would recommend you do is take that homework that was assigned on Thursday and make sure that by the end of Friday, before you go out and have a nice weekend, you look through each and every problem assigned and just make notes. Which ones do you think are going to cause you problems? Which one is just a WTF? I have no idea what's going on in this problem, okay? Um, as the course goes on, I'll actually start cursing like a sailor, so just get used to it. Um, Saturday, Sunday, have fun, but also please really work the homework, okay? I would just really try, just try, just, just try a problem like here and there. And don't pick the ones you think are going to give you problems. Pick the ones you think are easy. Get those out of the way, okay? Get the low-hanging fruit. By the end of Monday, so, you know, office hours on Monday, let's say, Monday afternoon, you should have at least tried to submit answers to the online system for any problems where you felt good, okay? Uh, if those are right, you're done, all right? You understood it. Move on. Go find the, the difficult ones. And come speak to me at office hours about problems you're having, okay? Uh, and of course, repeat, rinse and repeat, Tuesday, Wednesday, keep trying. If you get stuck, talk to the TA, talk to me. And then Thursday morning, 9 a.m., that's when everything has to be signed, sealed, and delivered on Wiley Plus. You're, you're graded on whatever is in there at the time. And then you bring your written solutions to the class, and you put them right up here, okay? And then I'll give them to the TA, and Andrew will randomly choose a problem of his own liking because it's evil or whatever, and then he'll see how everybody did, okay? And then rinse and repeat. Uh, exams will always be on Thursdays, so we'll squander three class periods doing exams during the semester, okay? Uh, yeah, and that's what I've already told you, basically. I mean, so the range of hours I expect people to reasonably put in outside of class, outside of these things, is six-ish to nine-ish hours. That's what I would expect for a three-credit hour course. Okay, so roughly four on learning and roughly four on homework. So four on learning, four on doing. Yep. Um, how do you... Uh uh, well, I'll give you example exams before the, I'll get to study from and to practice, I'll give you sample exams before the actual so That's going to be pretty similar on the actual ones, like what, what Oh, identical in okay. style. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I don't like surprises. You shouldn't like them either. So, yeah, okay, good. That's the right attitude. No, I don't like surprising people. I mean, yeah, you won't know the exact content of the questions, but the format is typically something like five multiple choice concept questions and two to three, kind of depending on how intricate the problems are, two to three problems to work. I mean, you got 80 minutes. What can I reasonably expect from people? Right? I can't go crazy here. So, and that seems to be hard enough. I mean, I would say students give me the sort of right range of reactions to that exam uh, that I would expect. People who are struggling, struggle. People who are not struggling, don't struggle. So, that's surprise, right? Okay. Okay, so there you go. If you like pie charts, 10% homework, 5% quizzes, 25% grand challenge, 60% in-class exams. Most of your grade is coming from individual performance. By the way, for homework, uh, feel free to work with people. And if you do work with people, just list the names of the people you work with at the top of your homework so I know who's working with whom. Be honest. In science, we collaborate all the time. We just report with whom we collaborate. You should do the same. Now, at the end of the day, you need to be able to perform on your own during exams. So if someone else in your group is pulling all the weight, or if you're working with a group or everyone else seems to know the answers all the time and you're totally lost, like the problem I had in college, get out of that group, bad group. Move on to some other group, find a different group, okay? Um, and also be cautious if you're getting per private help from a physics major you already know. Um, they may not remember what it was like to struggle through this class or a class like this, and they may be talking up here, and you're just trying to understand things down here, right? And I've seen this happen. So be a little careful if you just get help from a friend in physics. They may not be thinking like you're thinking. Uh, to them, there are eight tricks that they know like that to solve the problem. But that's because they've seen the problem before. You never have. I try to put myself in your heads as much as I can. Uh, of course, I'm getting old, so that's getting difficult. Um, but I will do the best I can to be sympathetic and empathetic with all of you. I know that this is your first time really seeing this material. Uh, how many of you have physics in high school? Okay, all right. This is going to be a little bit different, uh, but that's good. That makes me feel a little bit better. Uh, I do use calculus during the semester, okay? And so the first homework that you have 
is really just a, let's see, where is that? This one here. It's really just a spot check. I know some of these questions you're going to look at and go, why is he asking me to do this? But just do it, get it done, move on, all right? This is due Thursday morning, 9.30 a.m., okay? Um, there is no online for this. This is just my own homework that I write up for you guys. I just want to see where everybody is strong and where everybody is weak in algebra, geometry, and calculus, because those are the things we exercise as muscles through the semester. I don't expect you to just be calc geniuses. We'll get there together, okay? Uh, physics is a way to teach calculus without just having it be all about the calculus, all right? So again, just take a look at this. It's due Thursday in class by 9 a.m., so just put a pile of them, your answers up here. Uh, try to follow the guidelines, so this is a good excuse to read the homework and quiz policy guidelines so you know what format I expect. Don't write your answers on this and then hand it in. That's not going to get you any good grades on form, okay? So this is a dry run. I want to see how well you guys can follow instructions and also how well you know how to do math, okay? So I hope you have lots of resources. You've got me. Uh, office hours, you can, you, can, you can arrange other discussions with me outside of office hours, but please be polite. Uh, and do that by email about a day in advance before you actually would like to meet with me because I need a plan. If I have time free in my schedule, I devote it to research. I make commitments to students. I make commitments to colleagues. I make commitments to attend meetings overseas by you know, web conference. So I need to know not 10 minutes before you want to meet that you'd like to meet because there's a good chance that time's already been scheduled away, okay, if you waited too long. So please, please, there's one of me and a lot of you. So if you need help, do not be shy about asking. You should ask for help if you're stuck on something. I, I'm your teacher. I should teach you, okay? Uh, but I just need a little advance warning, okay? Uh, the teaching assistant will set up, for sure, at least one help session per week. Uh, we may need more than that to cover the people who can and can't make various days. But uh, in addition, I will ask him to set up his own like office hours. Uh, he could, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, you could contact him as well. I'll give you his email address. And if you need help outside of class, you can ask him as well. But again, be respectful of his time too. Uh, he has other commitments as well besides his teaching. So it's just good form to you know, give somebody enough advance notice that they can schedule it. Uh, this is the website. Okay, so I, again, I will post these slides. Uh, this is the course website. Let me uh, see if I can bring this up. So you see what it looks like. Okay, so this is what the main course site looks like. Uh, pretty graphics, blah, 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 a bunch of boilerplate stuff. Uh, important things that are here, this is the Wiley Plus with Orion course page. We're using the 10th edition of, uh, of the book. So it all comes bundled if you have the online learning system. It's all in there, the book and everything else. But student solution manual, it's all in there for you, okay? Uh, and then there's lots of information here if you're not sure how to sign up for an account about uh, I made a whole folder of Wiley Plus stuff, okay? So this is all stuff that the company sent me to give to you guys. So it's all here if you need it. You can print it and kill trees if you need it, all right? Uh, I feel really guilty about that pile of paper. I'm just, for the record, all right? So uh, lots of stuff about, you know, my office hours and, and, and then the TA, your grade composition, links to the Grand Challenge guidelines, uh, just a bunch of stuff here that I've already talked about. And then if you click on class material, this is the, this is the meat. All right, so there's a link here to the material that I've handed out today. So this is the first day material, homework, policies, syllabus, all that stuff. Okay, so you can take a look at that. Uh, the, the current lecture is always highlighted in green. I did a little programming and made a nice little web page that does this for us. And the past uh, classes are highlighted in gray. So the gray ones have passed already. Uh, we're currently on this period, of course. There's homework assigned, so this is a link, hopefully, to the, uh, the homework assignment. Oh, I'll fix that. That's easy enough to fix. I know what the problem is there. Um, you have a paper copy anyway. And now, this is your reading assignment for the next class, okay? So this is, the, when I say reading assignment, this is what's assigned today that you will be quizzed on next time, all right? So I can make that clearer if you need it, but I'm going to say it out loud now. So the reading assignment from this class is what we'll then have quizzes on and discuss uh, with problem solving and so forth next time, okay? So that's what I expect you to do. There's no lecture video to look at for this. I just expect you to go and read and take notes and then we'll start playing around with the stuff in this chapter when we get to the, uh, to the next lecture, okay? And then so forth, you know, marches on.
keeps going. Okay? Questions? Yes? So will there be a quiz? Yes, there will be a quiz. And it will be a combination of stuff from the reading, and I really do want you to go through these policies. So I might throw in one question from one of the, the syllabus or something like that. Just I want you to read. Please take that seriously. Because what's going to happen otherwise is in three weeks, somebody's going to go, I didn't know that that was on the syllabus. And I hate that. I always wanted to get a t-shirt that just says it's on the syllabus. So, so yeah, there will be a quiz at 9.35-ish at the beginning of next class, and it will cover conceptual stuff from the reading. There won't be any calculations you have to do. It's just concept questions to make sure that, that you're following along. That's all. Okay? Yeah? Um, the extended access, is that a textbook or is it online? Uh, well, the, the textbook is all bundled into that Wiley Plus thing online. So the textbook is already there. Is that what you meant? Or? Uh, there's a <clears throat> extended access on uh, the textbooks. It's like the first one that says it's recommended, and then there's another one that says it's just uh, oh. the file. Let me go about that. Let me go back to that. Let me see what I said there. Uh, oh, that, that's exactly it. So that, I mean, so that required thing is all here. It's all in this Wiley Plus with Orion course pitch thing. Okay, so it will be at Wiley Plus last, uh, last year. Then you, you've already paid for it. You have it already. Not last semester, but last year. Oh, last year? Uh, it should still be good. Try your code. And if it doesn't work, then I'll send you to the Wiley representative for our institution and she'll get it sorted out for you, okay? All right, any more questions? Okay, then let's talk electricity and magnetism. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, get that, get this going. Very exciting, okay. So uh, I have here uh, an ordinary PVC pipe. Okay, so this is just plastic. Can you verify that there's nothing funky about that? No batteries, nothing like that. Okay, right? Yeah, no, it's like it's a magic show, right? <laughs> nothing up my sleeves. Okay, actually magnets up my sleeves. All right. I also have here a very simple, yes, recently cleaned uh, soda can. Okay, so again, nothing funny about that, right? You're not even going to look. This is your terrible magician's assistant here. All the shills are in the front row anyway. Look inside, no batteries, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what's your name? Alex. Alan, okay. Now, all the plants are in the front row, right? That's how that always works. So, all right, and again, if I, there's nothing funky going on here. So if I rest the can on its side, all right, and I move the plastic around, absolutely nothing interesting happens. This is just boring as sin, right? Okay. Well, sin's actually quite interesting, but anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. All right, so, all right, now I have an ordinary paper bag, and what I'm about to do is something called uh, triboelectricity. So triboelectricity is the inducement of an electrical phenomenon by rubbing. That's it. All right, so how many of you have ever played with balloons at a party and, like, rubbed one on your head and then stuck it to the wall of the ceiling? Okay, great. That's triboelectricity. It's got a fancy name. Everything's got a fancy name, right? Uh, there's a word for everything. So... Tribal electricity is just rubbing, okay? And what's going on is that the atoms in the surface of the paper bag and the atoms in the surface of the plastic are passing by each other. They're not actually making physical contact. In fact, when you touch a surface, you're not actually making physical contact. Your atoms are never actually touching each other. Your electrons don't touch your, the electrons on the table. The nuclei in the atoms never touch the nuclei in the, in the table. Uh, atoms are mostly empty space. What's going on though is obviously <coughs> solidity. My hand doesn't go through the table even though my hand is mostly empty space and the table is mostly empty space if you actually know the structure of the atom. Why? And the answer is fundamentally electricity. The reason my hand doesn't pass through this table is electricity. But to understand that, you need to understand something about the electrical phenomenon and the force that's associated with it. Otherwise, this makes no sense. And once you know something about the atom, this makes no sense because your hand should pass right through the damn table. But it doesn't, and that's a good thing, all right? So if I just rub this, the atoms are passing by each other. And what's happening is that because these are two dissimilar materials with different chemistry, uh, different numbers of electrons in their outer shell, some of which are very easily removed. 
The friction strips electrons from one material and places them on the other. Now, I personally don't care which is which because I can just demonstrate there are two charges using dissimilar materials. But now that I have a charge built up on this, I can make the can move. Why that happened at all is fascinating. This thing had no force associated with it originally. Let me drain the charge off this and me, okay? I can remove the electrical phenomenon. That's called neutralizing the material. I can make them what's called electrically neutral where there is no net electrical phenomenon anymore. And simply by rubbing, I can induce that phenomenon. Now, okay, who has hairy knuckles? That's the spirit. What's your name? <laughs> Jerry. 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 All right. You feel something? The hairs? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what you're feeling is something called the electric field. Uh, that's the way we describe this. It's, uh, it's gone by many names in the history of science. Spooky action at a distance. Uh, force at a distance. Action at a distance. Um, basically, it's a force that's transmitted through space with no physical contact. And the way that we describe this, we'll get to in later chapters, is something called the field concept. But with no physical contact, you can feel the force. And what happened to the hairs in your hand, they you know, stood up a little bit, kind of tickled a little, is essentially what's happening to the uh, atoms inside of this can. So this can is made from aluminum. Okay, aluminum is a very good electrical conductor. That means that charges placed on the aluminum are free to move with very little resistance. Not zero, but very little resistance, wherever they like. And in fact, right now in this can, if you were to zoom in and could look at an atom, those atoms are jiggling around because the room has air molecules and the air molecules are smashing into the sides of the can and that's causing the atoms in the can to vibrate in their little metal crystal lattice positions. And so this whole thing is actually vibrating very fast, but atoms are tiny and we're big and we don't see that. We, th we, we experience that jiggling as heat. All right, so when you put your hand on a hot plate or on a hot stove or by a fire, your atoms begin to jiggle in response to radiation on your skin or if you make physical contact with the metal element, heating element, the vibrating atoms in the metal, and you feel that as heat, okay? That's the vibration of atoms. It's atoms in the material crashing into the atoms in your hand, and that can do real physical damage if you're not careful, just like electricity can do real physical damage if you're not careful. So what's going on is that because this is a very good conductor and charges are free to move inside of it, even though this has no net electrical phenomenon associated with it at first, if I submerge this in the electric field from the plastic, when I put a net charge on it, I can make all the charges move to one side of the can. Let's do that again. Okay, so I can make the charges that want to be closer to the guys on the plastic come closer to the can, and all the other ones move to the other side. And then as the can rolls, those charges get pulled down and then they move back up. And then the can rolls again and the charges move back up. They really want to be as close to the electrical phenomenon as this as, I can possibly, as they can possibly get. That's the cool thing about conductors. Charges are free to move and you can do mechanical, you can change electrons and charge into mechanical energy very quickly just by tricking the electrons in here to move through the surface. They can't leave the surface. I could make them leave the surface by say striking this with lightning. That would be a good way to get all the charge off this thing, but I don't want to do that. That would destroy the can. Now, Ben Franklin was one of the first people, okay, how many people have heard of Ben Franklin? Let me start there. Okay, yeah, so famous historical figure in the United States, founding father of the country, blah, 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 but a scientist as well. Okay, scientist, statesman, all that good stuff. One of the things that he investigated was this electrical phenomenon. And, you know, there are famous apocryphal, apocryphal, apocryphal stories about him flying kites and thunderstorms. He wasn't an idiot. He knew how deadly thunderstorms were. He would never do that experiment holding a kite. Okay? He, he might have tried this with the kite staked to the ground, but he wouldn't have gone anywhere near the thing. It's Ben Franklin that we can thank for recognizing and then giving names to 
the two different kinds of electrical phenomena that appear to be in nature. There are positive electrical phenomena and negative electrical phenomena. And the way that you can see that there are two kinds is what I hope will be this semester a simple and functioning demonstration. <laughs> this didn't work so well last semester, but I'll do the best I can. All right, so I have here a, an evacuated glass tube sealed at both ends. Okay, so glass and plastic are very different materials. Uh, so what I can do is I can put this in this little noose. Try to balance it. Balance it. Balance it better. Very exciting, right? I get paid big bucks to do this. Okay, there we go. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to drain all the charge off myself. What I'm doing here is if I have a net electric charge on me, even a little bit, I can remove it by touching a conductor that goes into the earth. The earth is a very greedy sponge for, for extra charge. It's sort of part of the problem you have with lightning storms. All right, but it's, this is called grounding yourself. Literally, you are connected to the ground. And it's a great way to leach extra charge off yourself. It's also what gets you in trouble in dry winter conditions when you shuffle your socks across the floor and then touch metal. So, yeah. Is that why, like, when you get out of your car and you try to close it, you just get shot? Yeah. Yeah, the car is usually grounded because it's making contact somehow with the ground. And so if you rub your butt against the cloth seats and now you've, you've had the tribal electric effect, you rubbed two dissimilar materials together, you have a net charge, the car seat has a net charge, but unfortunately you're the one that touches the metal shell of the car. So you get a little jolt. This is also why they tell you that when you gas up your car, when you get out of your car, ground yourself. If you have a net charge on your finger, and you go to gas up and the spark jumps into the gas fumes, boom. This is what causes gas uh, pump fires. It's not cell phones, right? That was a big myth that was propagating in the 90s and early 2000s. It's static electricity. And it's because people that talk on their cell phones get out of their cars without using their hands because they're talking. So there was a miscorrelation with cell phones and gas pump fires. It wasn't the cell phones that were doing it. It was the fact that you, know, you kind of get out of the car and you stand up and then you go over and you get the gas pump and you start pumping it up. You never touch something that's grounded when you do that. If you have a free hand, when you get out of the car, you might grab the roof of the car, kind of push yourself out, all right? So it's, it's that that saves you when you're not talking on a mobile phone, all right? So, so yeah, fun fact, actually. Yep, that's what causes that spark. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to put a charge on the glass. Whoa. Maybe I should knock that more tight. Let's try that again. Okay. Okay. And then, all the excess charge off. Now, these are dissimilar materials. I knew this wasn't going to work in front of you. It works fine before class. Oh, there we go. What's that doing? It's speeding up. What if I go to the other side? Using the power of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> there is an awakening in the force. The dark side and the light. <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, great. So whatever the electrical phenomena is here, this is an attractive force. I can put the plastic, which is charged, on either side of the glass, which is also charged. And apparently they're charged in such a way that the glass wants to follow the plastic. All right, now let's repeat this experiment with, and then again, grounding things. Okay. Let's repeat this with a plastic rod instead. Similar material to what the, the PVC pipe is made from. Okay, so again, charge that up. All right, so the previous one was attractive. Again, no net charge. Ah, the dark side. The repulsive force. It doesn't want to be anywhere near it. OK. 
Can I reverse the motion? Yes. Feel the power of the force. I grew up with Star Wars, just in case you don't be really clear on that. So, and I really liked Palpatine. All right, so, so what have we, we always see? We have done what in science is called an observation. There is an electrical phenomenon. It appears to have two aspects, one attractive, one repulsive. It seems to be related to dissimilar materials and similar materials. If I rub similar materials, whatever charge I'm putting on the PVC pipe, if we imagine that like charges repel each other, I'm also putting on that plastic. But if I take a different material and rub it with the same material, it must be that the charge transfer goes in the other direction. And so if this has a net negative charge, let's say, this one has a net positive charge, and they attract each other, whereas two like charged objects repel each other. And it's these kinds of observations made over a long period of time that led into a final mathematical understanding of what was going on here. So with that in mind, enjoy your reading. We'll have a quiz on that on Thursday morning. Do your math homework. This is a chance for us to diagnose any problems in math right now. And I'll see you Thursday.